Welcome to the first school committee meeting of the academic year 2016-17. Um, uh, Cindy Starks will not be with us today. She has unfortunately broken her wrist and we wish her a speedy recovery. Uh, Ms. Johnson is also not with us today, which means we will defer our discussion of monthly reports and financial issues until another meeting. Uh, we have some artwork today. We have um, over here, we have, um, we're going to the zoo. Preschool One had a roaring good time with our zoo theme. The preschoolers enjoyed reading books such as Goodnight Gorilla by Peggy Rathman and Going to the Zoo by Tom Paxton. This display represents several animals that we incorporated throughout our zoo unit. We use different art mediums such as sand, marble paint, and feathers to complete each of the art projects. Uh, moving over here, we have um, uh, the, the group of strawberries. Um, it's artwork by PS2, Ms. Ferranti's class. This lesson is designed to introduce predicting as a reading strategy to primary students using the book The Little Mouse, The Red Right Strawberry, and The Big Hungry Bear by Don and Audrey Wood. In this lesson, students make and refine predictions. Students should have some experience making guesses and making predictions about events that are story, not story related. As students develop their skills in making predictions, they learn to modify or change their predictions based on information from the text. Then the students made puffy paint strawberries. A lot of fun all around. Um, over in the back wall, we have layers of spring colors, um, preschool four. All the students in my class did this project. It was a group effort. We used acrylic paint, a white easel, and spider rings to create this piece. Each student chose a few different colors, dabbed the spider ring in the paint, and made impressions of the ring onto the easel. After several days, they covered the entire easel with all of these beautiful colors. Enjoy. Uh, in the back as well, um, Preschool 3, we read the book A Color of His Own by Leo Leone. The story begins by introducing familiar animals and illustrating their color. Elephants are gray, goldfish are red, powers are green, etc. It states that all animals have colors of their own except for the chameleon. On the lemon, they are yellow, in the heather, they are purple, and on the tiger, they are striped. One day, the chameleon has an idea. If I stay in a green leaf forever, I will have a color of my own. This is a fun preschool book, but it also deals with some very adult themes. In the end, the chameleon meets up with another chameleon and decide to travel and change together and thus living happily ever after. Our art is a children's interpretation of the story. And over here, um, preschool five, uh, fireworks. The children showed their 4th of July excitement in this art project. They used finger paints with paint scrapers. Then they added glitter and confetti to make the background sky. The shooting rockets firecrackers were added with beads spin art and magic noodles for a fun 3D effect. Enjoy. So it's always great to see the amazing um, output of our students, our young students. Uh, so we're first, uh, let me just actually give a quick overview of what's going to happen today. Most of the meeting today is updates. <laughs> and that seems completely fitting for our first meeting. Uh, but our next thing on the agenda is public participation, and I didn't see any names. Is there any public participation? There isn't. Okay. Okay. So, oh, actually, so we have a slight change in, um, in for the report about the building oh. projects. Is that... When, I'm, I'll turn this over to Dr. Bodie. Well, we could just go right into the superintendent's report. Okay. Do, uh, were we going to do? Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to. Okay. If, if uh, I was planning to start out with just an open, opening day, but um, this evening, um, Rob Usala, who is our owner's project manager for the Stratton project, for the Thompson modulars, and now for the Gibbs project, um, offered to come and give you an update. And I said to him <laughs> that. Well, I was planning to do the update. You're you're going to get a lot much more in depth overview of what's going on with those projects. Uh, it's been a very um, intense last month, in particular, as we've tried to get everything completed. And I wanted I want to compliment Rob because he's really stayed on it to make sure that everything was done uh, in order that we were going to be able to open. And so uh, I would like to invite Rob up to the microphone, and he could just give the report, and then I'll go. I'll defer to talking about opening day and all the other opening activities till after that. That way, he can go home. <laughs> That'd be great. Um, welcome, Rob. Um, and then we'll we'll go to questions um, on those issues. Good evening. Uh, my name is Rob Usula. I'm a senior project manager with NV5 Company. We're the owners' project manager, as Kathy just said. For 
the Stratton project, the Thompson modulars, and now the Gibbs school project. Uh, an update on the Stratton school project, the modulars are open. Uh, on August 29th, uh, a certificate of occupancy was issued by the building department. Uh, prior to that, the fire department walked through, all the different town departments signed off. Um, and so they got their occupancy permit on the um, 23rd of August. Um, all the materials that were being temporarily held in the gymnasium, the cafeteria, and the kindergarten rooms up at Stratton were moved into the new modular classrooms along with all the furniture. And then the next day on the 24th, the teachers were allowed in to set up their classrooms and be ready for school. I want to thank the Arlington Department of Public Works as well, who built the temporary staff parking lot adjacent to the new modulars, mm -hmm. as well as striped that lot and did a last minute striping of a new drop off area for uh, parents and special education students in the existing parking lot in front of the Stratton School. In terms of the renovation of the uh, school itself, uh, the contractor GNR Construction is finishing up demolition um, inside the building. They've installed a new boiler. They're installing new hot water heaters. Uh, the new roofing has started. They're finishing up some abatement of some uh, uh, asbestos pipe fittings and some miscellaneous work inside the building. And right now they're working on underground and under slab utilities for the new kitchen and all the new bathrooms and all the new plum plumbing throughout the building. Right now, they're approximately 25% uh, through construction, scheduled to finish up next August. The Thompson modulars, um, we kind of sweated out waiting for Eversource to arrive to connect power. Uh, they did arrive last Monday on the 29th. Uh, they tied in power, which was good because the fire department came out the next day to check the fire alarm system and all of that. Uh, the building inspector came out that day too, did a final inspection, issued a certificate of occupancy. Um, the mods were clean, the floors were waxed, uh, and it was up and open for the opening of school. In terms of the Gibbs project, the designer selection committee of the Permanent Town Building Committee interviewed four firms on August 11th and narrowed that down to two firms, DRA and Feingold Alexander Architects. Uh, and after a second round of interviews, Feingold Alexander was selected to be the architect for the Gibbs School project. We actually had a kickoff meeting yesterday with uh, Kathy and the um, Feingold Alexander team, their educational planner, um, and um, Eileen Wood, the interim principal of the middle school, was there in attendance too. And we'll be uh, scheduling some additional meetings with um, department heads, some te teachers, and parents to let them know as the design progresses what's, uh, what's going to be happening. The Permanent Town Building Committee on Tuesday night also approved proceeding, procuring the, pr the construction part of the project as a what's called CM at risk project. In 2004, the state legislature under construction reform approved using CM at risk, a process where you hire a contractor early in the design phase instead of waiting, mm -hmm. finishing the design, putting it out to bid, going with the lowest bidder. In this case, you bring a pre you pre-qualify contractors, bring them on board early so you get the benefit of their input, reviewing the plans before they go into construction. They will do uh, construction cost estimates as well as we will do check estimates to make sure the numbers all agree. Um, they will contribute things like constructability, I have an easier way to build this, I have a quicker way to build this. So you take advantage of the architect's input, the contractor's input, and our input to get a generally a project that's done in less amount of time than a general design bid build project. Mm -hmm. So part of that um, processes. We file an application with the Office of the Inspector General who has to review on behalf of the town do we have the capability between the town and the owner's project manager and the architect to do this process. And Feingold Alexander has done multiple projects with this. My office has done I think over 25 projects like this over the last 10 years. I've personally done about four projects in the last five years using CM at risk. So we all have a lot of experience using this and we all 
frankly endorse this as a, as a better way mm -hmm. to do public construction. So the, that application is going in, and today I submitted a, uh, to the Central Register an advertisement for the uh, request for qualifications for contractors. So that will come out next Wednesday in the Central Register. In meantime, we will be calling contractors to let them know this is coming out because we want to get as much participation on the pre-qualification side as we can. And then we'll go from there. Any questions? Questions. Uh, Mr. Cardin. So under, under that um, framework, when will the actual project go out for bid? Probably, well, it's, it's technically not the same as a regular bid. They will bid what they call trade contracts, which is subcontractors' contracts, probably in next March or April. And then after that, the contractor will sign with the town what's called the GMP, a guaranteed maximum price which will include those numbers as well as his side of the construction. And again, that's all open book um, budgeting. We get to see his numbers. We get to see how he broke his numbers down, how he arrived at those numbers and stuff too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I just have a question. So uh, do you then um, use more than one contractor during this sort of pre-qualification or is when it? When you do pre-qualification, they like you to have at least three. Three, okay. Um, and then, and then, based on that, the there's a pre-qualification kind of mm -hmm. committee that will decide who's the who's the best fit for the town. Got it. Got it. And after that, that's basically the only person you deal with. It's not like public, like design, bid, build. It's not open to any contractor. Right. You have to be pre-qualified to go to. It's one of those. Phase. Got it. Yes, Mr. Mr. Thielen. Could you just uh, give us the sequencing of the projects, the uh, when the construction actually begins? So I just want to. The clear. construction for the Gibbs will begin probably um, next June. Okay, and then the Thompson. Do we have a? Do we have a plan? For the, do we have a kind of well, a Thompson has to go before town meeting oh, okay. for a vote of appropriation. Even though there was the override vote in June, that money now has to be appropriated. But even before that, the school enrollment task force needs to meet, and. Um, endorse that recommendation yeah. so that meeting i think is get the first meeting of that committee is scheduled october 5th yes. and then special town meeting is the 19th and then so that project then well we've we've in anticipation uh as you know we went ahead with having a designer do the design on the project we have selected an owner project manager, which is the same company that did the original Thompson. Good. But in addition to that, I think Permanent Town Building also endorsed going forward with um, putting the bids out mm -hmm. for the um, for construction. And so, assuming the town meeting approved, for, assuming we have an endorsement from the task force. And then assuming that town meeting votes for it, we will be ready to go. In October. In, October no, 20th. probably October 20th. Great. Right. <laughs> okay, that's Next what morning. I want to start right. sequencing. Okay. So that's the sequence. Now, we may not have all the selections done, I think, on the Thompson con construction. It's not, it's not, I'm not clear on that, but I think our operative goal was November 1st to be able to go and and everything is based on being able to when i say everything based on it means opening in september is based on being able to start november 1st thank you anything else great thank you very much thank you. thanks very for much. your time thank you rob thank you we are going to have a parent night, and we've, tend to, we've scheduled it tentatively for um, October 27th, but that, no, no, September 27th. In this process with Gibbs, uh, the, while we have a diagram from our HMFH study that shows that we can put all of our programming into the Gibbs building, because that was important to find out. That doesn't mean that it has to be the way that it is currently designed, because it was what would they call a fit diagram. 
So there, we're going through a process this month of, of involving a lot of stakeholders in um, thoughts about this, which the designers are all going to be listening to, and then at the end of September, begin with putting together their designs. So we do have a parent forum scheduled, and I will put that out to parents. It's, um, it is a Tuesday night, I believe, the 27th, and we, the week before that, we're working on ha having something with teachers as well. And the, the uh, educational consultant from Feingold and Alexandra will be the facilitator of this, mm. which is something he's done many, many times. Okay. <coughs> Will be on the mailing list as well for that. Program. I will definitely send send you a maybe more than one reminder. We'll put it out there. For me, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. that, that that's going to happen. Great. I, I just need before I put it out, I wanted to confirm the teacher date uh, because I think it's important that the teachers meet first. And the board was meeting today. In fact, maybe even Miss Sarasen can tell me, <coughs> did we have thumbs up going forward with the proposal? Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. So the thumbs up means that we're going to do an early release day on the 20th, which is an early release day for Audison, uh, to do the, uh, it's a voluntary meeting to do the visioning on the Gibbs. And then a week later, we'll have the evening meeting with parents. And I will put that out to Audison parents by Monday. Are we staying in contact with Needham in the sixth grade program just for? Bouncing we will. ideas back and forth. We, definitely. In the idea that we all seem very <coughs> positive about that building and the way things are being run over there. Th that was an existing building, right. just like Gibbs is an existing building. I, I think we, I had, um, uh, God bless you, we, we had a lot of important ideas that came up from that meeting, uh, and during this month I'm going to, you know, circle back with the right. principal just to, to talk about some takeaway ideas and some suggestions as we try to think of how to be creative with the space. Thank you. All right. So I actually, so we have a lot to cover and I know there'll be questions on some of the stuff. So if, if it's okay with you, I'd like to welcome questions sort of as we go along. Oh, sure, yeah, that's, that's fine, because we have lots of different topics. In yeah, fact, lots of different topics. In fact, since we're on the topic of building, uh, let me just keep that theme going for a second, if I could. And that is that we're, we're also moving forward with this building, the high school. And there, we are in the first module, and there's been a number of documents that have, are required. In fact, t three big ones are due tomorrow. So we've been uh, working very hard on this the last couple of weeks. But we also had to submit in early August, as you know, the committee for the high school. Mm -hmm. And we had an extraordinary uh, number of people who were interested in being on the committee. We had 49 people, and having read through all of their emails or resumes, we had an amazing array of talented professional people who really want to be part of this. So um, we selected uh, through that process, and it wasn't easy, I have to tell you. We went, it, it took a couple of meetings to do this, uh, 10 people that we interviewed. And as a result of that, we actually decided, uh, after further thought and actually some conversations with other districts, to increase the number of community members on that committee to seven. So we have a committee now of 17, which is a lot. So the committee has been selected. The work of the committee probably really will not begin until after we get accepted in the feasibility study, which you know, the earliest, I think, would be the, uh, that meeting in January. Mm -hmm. So, but it's part of the process. And so we've had to complete uh, a number of reports, an educational report, an enrollment report, um, and some reports, uh, and that include, and, and the enrollment run included building permits, housing permits. It was just a very extensive report in terms of all the activity in the town that might generate student enrollment. And Mr. Hainer's question. Are we on time with all that to be ready for them? Well, you came in on us a couple times today. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> we submitted two just before this meeting, and we have a third one to go, and it's going in tomorrow. So we're exactly on time. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. All Sorry right. for the interruption. That was all right. Okay. It didn't break our train of thought. Yeah, I'm sorry, Miss. Uh, if we're going to stay on, on building projects for one more minute, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so, if if we're going to request modulars for either the Hardy or the Audison for next year, that's probably going to have to go to the school enrollment task force on October 5th, mm -hmm. which means it has to come to us at our next meeting. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. And so you know, a placeholder has been put into the warrant. Right. For this. And, and, I, and I will tell you that the, the middle school has been working on this. In fact, um, really trying to think as, you know, as creatively as possible, not that we want to have everyone squished in the building, but the fewer modules we can do with creative moving of classrooms is what we want to do because, I mean, the original thought about the number was simply a mathematical thought. It didn't take into consideration how you could, you know, create a, a puzzle there of how people would use the space. And the fewer modulars we can do, one would save them town money, but also um, would take up less space up there. And, if, you know, though, Addison parents, you know that parking lot is not enough. In fact, uh, we don't really have, it's been a struggle even right now with parking. And um, we're, we're looking into some ways that we can find some additional parking spaces. So to, to have fewer spaces taken up by modulars would be really tough for a year. So that's what we're working on. All right. Um, opening. Well, opening day, I'll just save quickly and then I'm going to go back to what led up to opening day. Opening day was so smooth this year. It was, it was calm in every school. Everything just worked very well and um, uh, I've, heard, I've had a number of teachers even tell me that and how, how great it was. You know on one hand you liked a sunny day mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you know sometimes having a rainy day isn't so bad. <laughs> you know because it just adds a little bit of a a little bit of a where we're ready to go back to school kind of feeling to it. Mm -hmm. But it went very well. Um, we had no transportation glitches. We really had, had virtually no issues at the start of school, which was terrific. But, but you don't get there without an immense amount of preparation. And I can tell you, having been in the schools over the last couple of weeks, teachers were in the schools everywhere setting up their rooms, and particularly at Stratton, because mm. all of their classroom materials were either in long-term storage somewhere, or the, sh the boxes for opening were, um, had to be unpacked. So they were there for almost a couple of weeks working on this, and they did a wonderful job. But I think that's true all over, all over the district. You, any school you went into, you saw teachers there preparing. The Permanent Town Building Committee had a tour about a week before the teachers started coming back in. And there was a lot of construction things. You were there that day uh, earlier. They were walking around and it looked like a place, and a little worried that it wasn't going to be there. I went back a week later talking to Mr. Hanner about the mock town meeting that we're going to do with the third grade. It looked like a brand new school. Mm -hmm. uh, everything was there, it really looked nice, and the teachers, the excitement of teachers coming back. Was. And, uh, to yeah, their credit, so. I'd like to I commend them and you yeah. for all the work. Well, there was a lot of work all around, and I commend the teachers because they, they were such good sports about it, too. They are very happy. Um, we have one more question. Dr. Allison Ampey. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, it was also a comment. I got to do the walkthrough for the families at Stratton, mm -hmm. and it's gorgeous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it was all set up. It looks nice. The, built, the rooms are very spacious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be hard to good. get them out of there next yeah, year. Yeah, actually. <laughs> I agree. And ACMI has a lovely video on yes. that I'm sure you can find on their website. So. Yes, uh, I sent you the link yes. to the web to it, and I want to compliment ACMI on that, and and also um, the advocate did a great Nick did a great job in uh, you know giving a preview of Stratton, and ACMI did a nice video, so I, I appreciate the advocates press on that. I think everybody was very there's a little nervousness I think out there about well what is this really going to look like, and it turned out, and I think on the part of teachers too, they were really pleasantly surprised to see what these rooms were. And in fact, 
um, they also were very surprised at the size of the rooms. Mm -hmm. That they thought they were going to be much smaller and they were going to feel very cramped. And, and I think that one of the things that Triumph did, the, the modular company, is put in um, cabinets, which wasn't in the original design, but it, it made a big, a big difference in there. So it was, it was terrific. Um, the building at Thompson was already a, a, a building, and pretty much that was ready to go, except it was just touch and go, getting electrified. Yeah. There, Rob didn't share this tonight. There was an issue about getting the electrical connection, yeah. and uh, Eversource finally said that they would be out on the 31st. Two crews showed up on the 29th, mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't know what they were supposed to do. Ruthie Bennett, uh, the town's facilities person, told Karen Donato, the principal, go stand in front of the truck and don't let them move until I get down there. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> and when she got down there, there was Karen out front. <laughs> they got it all connected and everything worked out well. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Rob raced down to make sure that they knew exactly what to do. So it worked out fine and then they came in and that one was a little bit closer to the edge than we would have liked to have been, but it worked out fine. Uh, so all in all, um, it, it was great. But the, the other pieces, and you're going to hear the report from Rob, and you know, how many new teachers we have this year. It's a little bit more than we've had in the past, and he'll talk about that. But the week before last, we, uh, Marie Janiak is our mentor program coordinator, and she ran, again this year, just a, just a terrific program for our new teachers, Primarily that week was our elementary teachers, giving them uh, a deep look, as much as you can have a deep look in that amount of time, uh, of the curriculum in key areas. And then we had an opening day um, meeting for new teachers, and thank Jeff, uh, who both came to that meeting, and also to uh, the opening day on last Wednesday, and he just did a terrific speech. So thanks, Jeff. If I may, uh, he made me want to come back and teach. He, he was very welcoming. He, he mixed a little humor with it and, and a lot of strength. It was well done. Yeah, well, it was very well done. So, um, so we had we had that the opening for um, teachers, and then on as I said on Wednesday, we had our usual opening ceremony, and um, had a video, which uh, Laura had had heard the speaker. Jamie Kasup, who is the educational guru at Google, and it was it was it really played into a lot of the themes that we've had. But interestingly, when we we finished the opening day, everyone went off to grade levels or to um, departments. And special education had a guest this year, and maybe you'd like to just talk a little bit about Tom Hare because he is really quite a um, um, a very well-known person in the world of education today. Right, we were lucky to have um, Tom Hare, who's a professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, but um, from a special ed perspective, more importantly, he used to be the um, director of the um, special ed programming under uh, President Clinton, so he had a unique perspective on both. He helped with the reauthorization of IDEA back in um, 97 and so it was really great to hear him speak he spoke about ableism um, you know as a community we've done a lot of work around um, you know diversity and culturally sensitive practices and we haven't really addressed this idea of ableism so we talked to the staff about that as well as some of the research that really strongly supports you know the idea that more time the more time students spend in general education the greater their outcomes so you know there's seems to be, you know, the pendulum swings back and forth, but lately it seems, you know, the call for more, you know, sub-separate programming, out of district placements, things like that, but really the research doesn't, doesn't support that and, you know, the greater outcomes as far as graduation, um, secondary education, employment, um, all those increase with more time spent in general ed, so. And he was a strong proponent, too, of using technology as a, an important yeah, learning um, tool. UDL, uh, Universal Design for Living, and right. assistive technology to really, you know, it's not just putting kids in a general ed classroom that makes them, you know, have these greater outcomes. It's how do you support them while they're in the general ed classroom. So we talked about that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, staff was really excited about it. We'd love to maybe right. continue working with him in yeah. some capacity. Can you just briefly just kind of define ableism? Um, ableism. So, it's, if you if you're thinking about racism, homophobia, or anything, it's when you know you um, limit the expectations of a person mm -hmm. who has disabilities, you know, based on their status as a person with a disability. 
Great. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was a full department. You had an, uh, an idea of what went on with special education, but each department also met <coughs> to discuss curriculum changes or plans for the year. And we also met by grade level at the, at the, at the elementary. So that was a very productive day, and teachers went back to their classrooms in the afternoon. And uh, the next day was um, full faculty meetings for the entire for the entire morning. So it was a very it was a good way to start. Um, I think that um, the feedback I've had from people when I've been around at schools was they they thought it was a great opening last week too. And then, uh, as I said, starting Tuesday um, went very well. Do either one of you want to comment on the opening day? Because I know you were around at schools too. But the thing that um, opening day was, I, I spent um, time at different schools, and I, but I, I just want to address the very first day, the teachers that were here. Um, one of the things that I think that we do that's very unique is that the grade level presentations that were done at the elementary level were done by teachers. They were not being done by outside people or administrators. We have our lead teachers who have gone are going through our lead teacher program, and uh, I think it adds a, lot, adds, adds a lot of credibility to the presentations, and I think it also makes teachers to feel comfortable to provide feedback to the person that's presenting. They, there definitely is um, very honest give and take, and I, I was really impressed by that. Okay. And we can, we'll talk more about teacher leadership later on, too. Mm -hmm. All right, so enrollment. I guess one of the big surprises this summer was just how many, how many students we were able to, we're going to, we are welcoming into the Arlington Public Schools this year. Um, as you know, last year, our kindergarten numbers did not meet what we thought they would meet in terms of the forecast by Dr. McKibben, or for that matter, even our own predictions. But, um, well made up for it this year. Last year we had 474 entering kindergarten students and this year it's down slightly, it's 558 as of today. So um, fortunately, they, the, the number of students were across town, but, but the tool of using buffer zones has helped so that one of the things when you, when you see the report which was put into Novus today, it's fairly even across town with respect to the kindergartens, which was a, an important goal this summer. Other class sizes have gone up as well because it wasn't just the kindergarten enrollment that went up. Uh, I think the, the high school saw a big jump, middle school saw every, just about an increase absolutely everywhere. So um, the number, the chart that you have today, uh, those numbers could change over the next month or so because we have to go through and do some verification. But one of the things that does happen, and, 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 and I will remind parents next spring as we go into the summer, that if you're going to move, um, please let us know. Because what happens is if we don't get notification, then we assume that the child's returning. We, we, there's no reason why the child would not be in power school and they're on class list. So over the next couple of weeks, we will be um, looking at all of that just to do some uh, some adjustments but I think that our process has gotten much much better over the last year and I don't expect to see a huge fluctuation already um, the change from if I was looking at October 1 numbers last year we had 5,252 students in the district we now have an increase of about 4.7 percent, and the total number K-12 is 5,498. We're almost at 5,500 students. So that's a that's a that's a, a lot. And of course, I, actually, one of the issues is it's it's also a lot in terms of just thinking about materials and desks. And so we have had to do um, a lot of you know, quick ordering and, and, and adjustments to make sure that all of, the, all of the students had a desk in our schools. But I think we've succeeded in that. I think we're, yep. we're okay. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Uh, I've talked to Dr. Bordy about my, one of my concerns about uh, the issue of full-time aides in the kindergarten. Uh, I appreciate the economic factor in this, uh, and Dr. Bodie has to look at balance both, and I shared with her, I'm more into the education aspect of it. The 
kindergarten is a unique place. It's where the diagnosis, you make the prescription for the next 12 years. And the kindergarten teacher spends most of his or her day assessing, and it has to be on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, I really feel that the importance of having full-time aides, good people there, to give the, uh, the kindergarten teacher the opportunity to do that work successfully. The, I, the investment there, to me, can be uh, show results in, in mitigating our uh, dealing with special needs and other issues coming on. So I would ask the committee to consider it. Uh, Dr. Bodhi has been very good in sharing uh, the input, and I, I, again, appreciate her need to balance both the educational and the economic aspects of it. But I see the, this investment with the possibility of having to take something from Peter to pay Paul on this well worth it. And I'd like the committee to consider it, and Dr. Bodhi as well. Thank you. Do we have, are there any full-time aides? Are there any? Uh, yes, we have hired some full-time aides. It depends on what the numbers are. And in some schools, uh, you might have, with four classrooms, you might have two aides that are working full-time and they're shared in the afternoon. One of the things that the teachers, the, I should say the principals do um, with kindergarten is that they try very hard to schedule all the specials in the afternoon. And they do that so that the morning, when they have an aide, the, 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 the aide is there to help with the morning curriculum. So sometimes it's not helpful. I mean, if, if a, a class is already out to art for the afternoon, it's easy to share a teaching assistant because the teaching assistant doesn't go to art class. So, we have looked at this very carefully, and we will continue to look at it. I mean, we're still enrolling students. Um, so we will look at it very carefully, and the principals, I assure you, are not shy in asking for support and what, what, they, what they need. But just to remind everybody, last year, our half-time kindergarten TAs were funded by the kindergarten grant. Mm -hmm. And anticipating that this might go away and, and valuing having ha half-time TAs, we made the decision to put it, those aids into our operating budget, which in turn was a, was a, and you all supported that idea, which was an important decision in terms of the effect it had on other things we could have done that we didn't do because we valued that so highly. So we didn't even have, you know, when we, the year before, we didn't have full-time TAs either, which would have been out of the operating budget. So this time it would be not only the half-time out of the operating budget, but if you add any others, it's, it's uh, full-time, you know, Wait, hold on, the sorry. Uh, Mr. Slickman had something. So we're up about 194 students from last year, <clears throat> give or take. Um, obviously, because this got loaded into, uh, uh, Novus today, you know, I've just taken a quick glance at it. The, the one thing that just catches my attention is, is the freshman class at the high school. Was that a little larger than we expected? No. Okay. No, it's not. Um. I'm sort of doing the math here compared to last year's eighth grade, and if we had kids go off to Minuteman, that must have been totally offset by new kids coming in. It was. Mm -hmm. They had a, a big influx of students into the high school. I, I, one of the deans, I think, told me that they had 80, 80 new students that, were, that arrived. In fact, one of these classes, and I, I think it was a junior class, was in the 200s earlier this summer. I think yeah. it was a junior class, but it, no, it's been a big, a big change. So we had 336 there. in the eighth grade last year, and we're showing 383 in, in, in oops, no, no, uh, 338. 338 in the freshman class this year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we have two more kids this year in grade year. nine than we had in grade eight last year, and we, I, I'd assume we sent our usual 30 kids off to Minuteman. We did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we had a big we had a big increase. It was across the whole district. Mm. These increase. And today I came in. I met a young tenth grade girl who she, this was. She just started and was lost. She was new to the school too. So I mean, it's not even just the freshman class. It's just across the board. Mm -hmm. I know that they've had a number of new students. Um, 
But overall, I would say that I'm, I'm pleased that we don't have any super large classes. Mm -hmm. I think we've, uh, this year, compared to what happened last year, our highest one right now is we, it did creep up a bit at, at one, in one class at Dallin. But um, overall, it's, it's not as bad as it could have been with the increases. Okay, Mr. Hainer, I have one more thing. I, I just wanted to mention that 84 of those new students, Mr. Schlickman, are in the kindergarten alone. Right. Okay, right. and if, if I, going forward, could we have uh, down at the bottom the capacity of the buildings, what they are supposedly supposed to be? <laughs> in other words, well, it's, it's, well, two, it's uh, what the, the building that. was supposedly built for. I can do that. Thank That's you. not an issue, but I'm not sure it's that helpful. And the reason why is that when you talk about the design capacity of a building, you're talking about your assumption of the number of students in a classroom. And that's how MSBA does it. They assume, so for example, when we get to the high school, when we go through the enrollment process, they will assume that I think it's 23 <laughs> is that they would have mm -hmm. for a homeroom. Mm -hmm. So Elementary so when you get the design over, number, it's, it's, it's what the assumption was per classroom. Now, does that mean if a classroom was designed for 22, that 24 is, you see, that, therein lies the issue. I'm just, I think it's, especially at the Audison, it's very important. We, we've exceeded MSBA, our needs, and everything else at Audison right now. Oh, we have, and I take my hat off to the, uh, our new principal and uh, the whole staff this summer trying, and, and, and with a lot of people at this table helping with this as well, just thinking about how to redesign what we needed to do in order to get another half cluster of the eighth grade in. Uh, we went through multiple draft plans. Mm -hmm. And so lots of compliments to, um, well, I was gonna get to that but I'll say it right now, to our maintenance department. Mm -hmm. The number of projects we did this summer was astounding, and they got them all done. And Audison's a really good example that the whole mezzanine area where art was, um, where art is, had to be reconfigured, so that's where the half cluster is for <coughs> eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And so we had to rechange, we had to change where the lab was, we had to get a sink in, we had to redo the, the rooms, um, move some programs downstairs. We had to move special ed. So there was a lot of moving parts there and trying to figure out where everybody was gonna be placed. Every inch of that school is being used um, very thoughtfully, I have to say. But it was, a, it was quite a effort to, Laura <laughs> shaking her hands, yes it was, uh, involving lots of people. Mr. Carden has a, has a question. Yeah, so I, I just counter to what Mr. Hainer said. I think we have to be very careful about when we put out numbers that mm -hmm. they be good numbers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we've had, you know, so many different numbers about capacity of school, design capacity. Mm -hmm. There isn't, for a lot of these schools, there isn't one number that we can point to as the design capacity. And even if you do, if you take Dallin, for example, that was designed, that school was designed with a computer room mm -hmm. and a science room. Those have now been converted. So is the design capacity considering that it's supposed to have a computer room and a science room, or is it a design capacity based on the number of rooms times 22 students? So I think those numbers are so uncertain that I don't really want to see them repeated in an official document over and over again. Mm -hmm. What I can get for everyone uh, is the design capacity, so you just have it as a reference, um, and we could, we could pull work. that out for them. So actually, I have a, a question about uh, the new families. I know we had once talked about having sort of in a welcome packet to new families coming at the higher levels grades um, because they're often sort of more lost when they enter into is that in place yet is that in production um they're working on it but because of the um, as you heard the number of new enrollments and having a new enrollment system this summer um that took up um the, the vast majority of their time but as that settles out um, so we don't have that information. We'll go back to it, no. Okay. Well, okay. I mean, we have mm -hmm. some information, but not what, I should say, not what we'd like to have. Got it. Okay. That was a prototype back at the beginning of the summer, but, but one of the things that I guess we shouldn't have been surprised at is once we opened the opportunity for online registration, 
that that's what how people have registered their children and, and people are much more adept these days of you know scanning uploading all of the re relevant documents so i would say the vast majority i would hesitate <coughs> what the percent was but Maybe I could say maybe close to 90%, oh, if, yes. not more, if not more, if not more, done all have, electronically. So they're like not coming people. into the registration office to get packets. Right, right. right. So we that's it. have to rethink still. this. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, okay, great. All right, so maybe it's a good time for, uh, for Rob to talk about the um, hiring. Sure. Make come down here. So we've had a very busy summer in my office and on the sixth floor and in all the schools. Uh, the hiring starts when there's a vacancy, when there's either a, a, a new position or a, vacate, a vacated position. And we post the position, hiring committees are formed at the schools or in departments. And you know, it started in the spring last year and continued, it continues till through today. Um, where over the summer teachers would come in and do uh, participate on committees to participate in hiring and the principals and all the um, special ed staff and coordinators and curriculum directors. So it's been very busy. Um, so first we have some new administrators. As you know, we have an interim principal at Audison this year. Eileen Woods is back um, in Arlington. Uh, we have a new um, special education coordinator at the Audison, because um, we, we did have a departure at the end of the past school year. The new, that, that person had been a team chair at the elementary level and has been in the district for several years. We have two new elementary special ed coordinators who are new to the district and are, we have a new out of district special edu education coordinator who had, that's Chris Carlson, who had been one of our elementary coordinators for the past several years. As of today, we have 57 new teachers, nurses, team chair specialists, these are positions covered by the AEA unit A bargaining unit. Um, it's a big number for this year. I mean, it's a little bit more, I think, than we've had in the past uh, couple of years. Um, 43 are replacing teachers who resigned, retired, moved to another position, or are on a full year leave. We have had some shifting, which has created some openings where some people, where vacancies occur and some people are moving from one position to another such as the team chair positions. We had a couple team chair positions open up at the elementary and we had uh, people already in the district move into those positions. Um, we have 14 new positions, some are partial FTEs. We mentioned the half cluster at Audison. Those are two new teachers here, although both of those teachers had worked here last year as long-term subs at the Audison and had experience at the school and were well known and, and uh, performed well last year in their long-term substitute positions. Um, and we had some grade level increases and other FTE needs. Um, we, ag again, as always, we have hired w from within. Um, 18 of the people have been teaching assistants or building subs or substitutes in Arlington. Um, several had done student teaching and, and long-term substitutes, as we, as we said. Dr. Bodhi also met, already mentioned the um, orientation and mentoring um, that uh, Marie Janiak has put together so, so well. And really, it's Marie and all of the lead teachers and curriculum directors really work hard to make sure that our new teachers are trained well in everything that they need to be, as much as they can be, in a few days right before the school year starts. And our t these teachers coming in have varying levels of experience. Some are new out of, out of school, out of grad school. Um, some have taught in other districts and have a little more experience. I have a breakdown of new hires by school. Um, this, again, this is changing a little bit day to day. We still have a, a few open positions that haven't been filled yet in, in the AEA bargaining unit. Um, We've also hired a lot of new teaching assistants, behavioral support personnel, tutors. This number is actually updated, um, but it's not updated on the on the on what you have. But it's I think as of today, it's 38 new people, and the hiring process continues. Teaching assistants are always hired a little bit later, just because it's a it's just a 
it, it's a more volatile position. A lot of the people in the teaching assistant positions are have been studying to become teachers, are licensed teachers, are looking for teaching positions, and as positions open up either in Arlington or in other districts, it creates an effect that we create vacancies and have to replace them. Um, we have added a few full-time kindergarten aides, some class size needs, and building substitutes. I, I, as of this uh, slide, seven that I counted had master's degree and others are in master's programs. There might be some more who have master's degrees now that we've hired. So we have very well educated teaching assistants in this district. Um, we also have a program for the past couple of years, our special education coordinators have worked with local colleges to have a combined internship um, hiring process where we're hiring TAs as interns. So they're actually hired at a little bit lower salary because they're getting, it's part of their, their program and they're getting a, a paid internship for the whole year to work in one of our schools. And we have several in the district this year um, with, through Wheelock College. And that's it. I just want to also, as always, thank, move back. Thank everyone, um, again, all the people at the schools, all the hiring uh, teams and the principals and, cu and curriculum directors and special ed coordinators uh, who work so hard all summer to get people in the district. The people um, on this floor who do a lot of work, our payroll department has been very busy. As um, you know, we have uh, right now an interim payroll uh, manager, an acting payroll manager, Connie Russell, who's been in the payroll department for several years as Julie McLaughlin retired at the end of uh, the last fiscal year. Um, and we have two relatively new payroll people in our department, uh, Mike Troiano and Vicki Sousa, who've been working, they've all been working very hard, long hours. The superintendent's office, Maria Lalicata, has been typing letters uh, like crazy every day. It's been very busy. Kelly Piggott in my office has been working with benefit enrollment and getting everyone set up on our evaluation system and in our uh, uh, on ASOP and all of the systems we need to, mm -hmm. to have done. And it's just taken, it's a lot of time, a lot of uh, long hours that people are working. Um, and our business office and everyone. It's just hard, to, I don't want to leave anyone out, but everyone's been working very hard. I also want to mention that we are still looking for certain positions. We have postings on our website for any open positions. We still have a few teaching assistant positions to fill, so if anyone is watching and is and knows people <laughs> who are interested. The other thing we really are looking for this year are substitute teachers, substitute traffic supervisors, or substitute crossing guards. We do have a need um, for some substitutes in that area as we're pretty much at capacity with our crossing guards um, all working um, in, in, at the spots and we need some substitutes who would be willing to come in and work um, in those spots on relatively short notice. And then um, we, um, and those are just morning and afternoon uh, positions. And there would be some training that you would get from um, Corey Retto in the police department. And, um, and substitute secretaries in our schools. We have a, f a need for that as well. So um, if anyone knows anyone, um, let me know. Mm -hmm. May I? Yeah, uh, I'd, Mr. Hainer. I'd like to consider in the bu upcoming budget uh, to investigate increasing uh, substitute teacher compensation. I think that may be part of the issue. Um, drawing substitutes. We cannot compete with the city of Cambridge, I know that, but uh, yeah. mm -mm. Yeah. We, need to, we need to become competitive. From, my, from just anecdotally, my conversations with other HR directors and other school districts, they all have an issue, no matter what they're paying, it's hard to find substitutes right now. And I, I, yes, we, we could raise our substitute rates. Um, that might help a little bit, but I, I don't think it would solve every problem. Mm -hmm. I don't either, but yeah. if a person has a choice to come here right. um, or get a considerable difference. And there are people who sub in many different districts. And, mm -hmm. you know, if we have an opening on a day that another district that pays more has an opening, they'll take the, dis the other mm -hmm. district. We're in the same system. That's part of the issue. Yeah. Great. What we've found over the years is that it's a, it's a pretty telltale sign of the state of the economy when uh, the economy wasn't doing well, we had a plethora. Oh. So yeah. th that, that probably is good news at a macro level. You might want to mention more about the traffic supervisors, because we, we, we have, we've had to put 
two so, additional ones on this. So we've added one at the Stratton, um, right on Mountain, right in front of the entrance to the modular there. So there's a, that the, there wasn't a traffic supervisor there the past couple of years, but now with the construction and with the change in the entrance, mm -hmm. uh, there is one there. And right now we have one at the Thompson. Um, right on Everett and University, right near the entrance to the, the Thompson and near where the modulars are there. Um, and I think the reaction to those have been, have been favorable. So um, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, thank the advocate for publishing, I think in this week's paper, there's a, a spread on some of our new teachers in yeah. town. So. Um, if you want to look and get some information about just a few of the the newly hired teachers in the district you can get that's really fun look at that yeah. So, yeah, Dr. Bodie, yes. can they exit from the modular units at Stratton out onto uh, Pheasant Street do they exit out on that side yes I'm just concerned the 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 maybe a need for a traffic supervisor there I know, I'm pretty sure it's a one-way street uh, but it I, I don't know if there's a need but with kids coming across uh, it, they're very clear. It doesn't have that big spans, and it's very difficult to see now with the modular units there ahead of time with traffic coming up. They're set, the modulars are set back considerably from. But there's because, also a chain link fence that yeah. wasn't there before. Um, well, we'll see how. I'm, I'm just concerned. I, it may not be necessary. Goes, we, we'll see. I was under the yeah. impression they were all exiting on to Mountain Street, but they. And that exit it's, was only going to be used for emergencies, so I could make it. Well, plans changed over the summer in terms of the, I, absolutely. the, the whole lot, lot of things about the project. But um, we'll I just see ask how you they to look, go. I'd ask you to look at it. That's you, all. Believe me, I'm sure that we'll hear if it uh, becomes an issue. But the Stratton one, or the, the Thompson one, we were initially going to be putting the person on temporarily, but um, it's so congested there. and. Speaking of Thompson, in terms of congestion and traffic, Mr. Hayner and I have talked about this a couple times this summer. One of, the, one of the concerns, and this is probably one of the reasons why we would also keep the traffic supervisor there, at least for the time being. So when people are coming from the Medford area down River Street uh, to avoid the stoplight, they will take a left on one of the side streets and then come down, yeah. um, come down Everett. So, it's, uh, it's a little bit more congested than it would even be from the, the parents that are there. But one thing they were also seeing um, at Thompson, and um, Officer Bruteau and I have talked about it this summer. In fact, I, I sent you a copy of the letter that we sent to the Board of Selectmen to have the Board of Selectmen consider making Purcell, which is a one-way street between Everett and North Union, one way going east. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that that's how it probably should be anyway, but as we potentially face all of this new construction at the back on the, on the North Union Purcell corner, uh, I think to, to consider having it both ways would be just a log jam. Teachers have to park along Purcell, uh, and then if a parent parks along the opposite side, you barely can get a another car down the center mm -hmm. and uh, so that's a real problem yeah. so I, I think we're going to be on the agenda Monday yeah, that's my understanding anyway so we'll see how that goes uh, hold on one second mr. Carton just going back to the hiring report um, two questions one is um, I, don't, I don't know if it's possible to get a breakdown of like the number of resignations versus retirements and I, whether I, that's it uh, is possible yeah whether I mean, that's actually, I'm actually say. interested in the trend over the last few years. Is that something that we need, as a district, we should be looking at, or is it just normal churn? So, I, actually, Nick sent me an email earlier this week asking me for the same the same information, and I really was trying to um, hadn't had time to really do a deep dive into the the data. And to this afternoon, I spent a little bit of time looking at it. I don't have. Hard, it, it, we had more resignations this year. You know, if you look from the past, you know, from the beginning of last school year until the end of the summer, um, we're significantly higher in terms of resignations mm -hmm. than we were well, in the same comparable time period a year before. Mm -hmm. um, 
there are many reasons for that. I've had exit interviews with a lot of the teachers, most of the teachers departing, not everyone, but many of them. There's multiple reasons for it. Um, it's kind of a coincidentally, uh, uh, there's, this year we've had several teachers who have moved out of town because they're either trailing a spouse who's being transferred or getting a different opportunity in another, in another state. Um, so we've had several in that situation. We've actually had several teachers who took jobs closer to where they live to cut down on very long commutes. We've had some mm -hmm. teachers in this district who drive a long way to get here. They've really liked working in Arlington, but for many reasons, for family reasons or other reasons, they've decided to look for jobs closer to home. Mm -hmm. And there are some people who've left for districts that pay more. Mo pay more. There may be some, dis some who've had dissatisfaction with their jobs that they had here and were looking for something different. We've had a few people leave education altogether for different reasons. Um, so there's, um, there is, uh, um, there's a variety of reasons. I can get you that the, the mm -hmm. numbers, um, I can't go into every specific about right, the right, reasons, right. but yeah. it, it, it varies. Um, mm -hmm. and then the retirements are pretty consistent the last couple of years. I think we had eight or nine, seven to eight, nine in mm -hmm. the past couple of years, um, from the teacher's side, mm -hmm. um, at the most, I mean, there haven't been a lot and I don't think in the next few years we're going to see a Lot, big numbers of retirements. We'll have a few each year, but um, we don't have, we're not in a position right now as a district where we have a lot of teachers ready to retire. Mm -hmm. okay. the, um, the, the second question was um, more specifically related to special education. So out of the you know, administrators, we've got three out of six coordinators that are new to the district, one who's who changed positions, so four out of six of at least three team chairs that I'm counting that are new mm -hmm. out of seven or so. Um, so, so, and a significant number of teachers as well throughout the district. So is that, is there any special reason for this churn or is this? Well, the coordinators, um, we added the out of district position. So okay. the need for three really was created by just adding a position. Adding a position. Um, one of the coordinators retired and is subsequently moving out of state. Right. Um, and uh, another coordinator had left for some of the reasons you described, you know. Um, so it was really kind of a one ad, really, mm -hmm. um, in that regard. Um, and as far as the team chairs, one of them became a coordinator, so right. that created that issue. We had another one leave for a higher paying district in the close mm -hmm. vicinity to us. <laughs> um, and you know, some were other personnel decisions that we made that we can't really speak to. So there was kind of a trickle effect. So when okay. one person mm -hmm. left, it created a vacancy yeah. in that one. Um, you know, in one particular elementary school did have a bit of turnover, but similarly, individuals either went to other positions in the district mm -hmm. or moved up in a position which created the vacancy, so. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, Mr. Schlickman has a question as well. See, you know, I, you know, when I heard a couple of key things, moving to other districts for higher salary and moving to closer to home districts, which raises the question of, um, is it way too expensive for our teachers to live anywhere near Arlington? Mm. Uh, which I think <laughs> is one of the prime issues. And if, uh, and if our teachers are priced out of the housing market anywhere within a reasonable distance, uh, they they become susceptible to jobs closer to home. That may be part of it. It also may be that they don't. I mean, they don't want to live in Arlington, or they they want. Maybe they mm -hmm. are living closer to where they grew up, or where they have other family. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know for sure every every detail. I just think, um, and I think there are several of these people who have worked in Arlington worked in Arlington for several years. Mm -hmm because they liked it here, they liked working here, and because of where their families are, you know, in terms of if they have young kids or whatever, um, they've decided that now it's, it's just, it's become too much for them and they are set, they live where they live and they're comfortable. I think there's multiple reasons. It might also be that there are some people who would like to live in Arlington who can't. I mean, that's probably valid. Mm. You know, because I wonder how much of an affordable housing effort we need to, to direct to people who work for the school department right because you know if, if this is hurting our chance to recruit or retain staff uh, you know it becomes 
uh, an additional problem that goes across the street. Right. I, yeah, that's probably true. I think a lot of our, you know, anecdotally, I don't know for sure, but I think a lot of our younger staff who don't have families yet tend to live in Somerville and Brighton and places like mm -hmm. where other younger people who don't have families yet live. Um, and then when you know, they move out and sometimes people are moving a little bit farther away mm -hmm. um, where housing might be a little more affordable a few towns over than and are still commuting to Arlington, I think. And mm -hmm. then some people are finding places in Arlington. It's just, mm -hmm. it varies. And we do work with the town when they do have affordable housing opportunities and we send notices out to our, our staff when there are opportunities for um, bidding on or lotteries sometimes because those are competitive for people to get some of the affordable housing mm -hmm. in, in Arlington but our staff is informed of it. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. I just want to comment that I'm really glad to hear that you're doing the exit interviews and everything. I know when I started we didn't even have an HR person mm -hmm. and I feel we were losing mm -hmm. information as people left and not knowing why and mm -hmm. I think just what you're doing is, the sense that I get is that that's the sign of a fairly healthy workforce that, you know, yeah, there's always going to be people coming and going, but we're not hearing they're leaving because they're strong job dissatisfaction or something. Or, I mean, maybe they're not talking about that, but. I will say, I mean, there are, it's, you know, obviously we have a big staff, we have a big district. Not every person who works here is going to um, you know, it, it's either going to be the right fit or they're going to love. And there are some people, honestly, who have said that it is job dissatisfaction. Sure. But I don't think that's the majority. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a few. And I think there's multiple reasons that people leave, mm -hmm. um, leave the district. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thielen. It, it might be helpful to get some comparative data from some of the other HR directors you've mm -hmm. worked with to see what the trends are. I, you know, one of the things that struck me when I met the new teachers is that a lot of younger people we hire mm -hmm. and, you know, younger people tend to join a district and then they get married yeah. and their spouse moves to, you know, wherever and they go with them or they have a child and they want to take time off. So I don't know. I think there's a lot of life events that, mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. my own experience in management that they, they cause turnover that are really no fault of the school or the school district. Mm -hmm. And, but it would be good to have, just have some comparative data, just to, okay. like other districts to see what they're doing. I bet you we're about the same mm -hmm. as a lot of our comparative districts. That's my sense. Mm -hmm. yes, yeah, yeah. And, and then, but then I think then if you look at some schools, and it varies every year, some schools, I, we didn't hire any new teachers mm -hmm. or very few. Um, and then other schools for, you know, just were a little bit more active in the hiring and have several new teachers. Um, so it, it really varies. And we do have some teachers who've moved grade levels in different schools. I know a couple of schools had a, a few shifts throughout the summer. And um, so, yeah, there's always something changing that open, tends to open up other positions. Mr. Hainer. Just a quick comment. Yeah. The, 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 con the education today, when I started teaching, teachers found a good job. They stayed there no matter what the distance was or anything. Uh, today, it mm -hmm. can be very transient. Right. Uh, I think that's and uh, they, they become, if they're in a good field, my son is a chemistry teacher, six different districts over the past 12 years because different opportunities and di different programs, and he was able to do it. Uh, yeah, I, I think people are more open to changing careers even, and we have, as I said, we've had a few people either leave, stay in their overall profession, like some of, some of our related, <coughs> a couple of our related service type of providers might be leaving, <coughs> education but still doing you know their basic you know what they've been trained to do and other people are leaving changing careers so um <coughs> great uh just cognizant of the time so we want mm -hmm. to we have a bunch more things to uh mm -hmm. to hear about from dr buddy Yvonne. all right uh the next on the list is the middle school principal search update um uh, we're very pleased that I, Dr. Eileen Woods is, is returning to Arlington to lead Audison this year. Uh, but we will be planning for a full search for principal. Um, I believe that we'll probably do some posting um, before the holidays because it would be nice to be able to begin uh, the process uh, of, of interviewing later and then if we if, if need be we could all, always open it again so i have in mind the idea that you op potentially could open it again but we'll see uh, i think we're in a, a very strong position in attracting a, a great candidate but 
having said that, I could not be more delighted to have uh, Dr. Woods here. It was just a seamless start to the year, so it was terrific. Um, Dr. Chesson, do you want to talk a little bit about summer professional development? Thank you. Um, we had uh, in total about uh, 611 days the teachers worked over the summer. That's about 384 participants. Um, the district spent about $80,000 um, in summer professional development. Um, we are very lucky that um, over half of that came through grants. And so the district uh, operational budget paid for about 37.6, which is about usually what we spend. I, have, I know that I signed some green sheets today, so we'll probably come 40, 50 is about what we, we budget for out of the operational budget. Um, some uh, professional development of note is we have 14 teachers that began a teacher leadership program. Mm -hmm. um, and that will be a graduate level course that will go throughout the year for teachers that are looking to be um, remain in the classroom but still be uh, leaders in curriculum areas. Um, we also had a um, beginning of a safe uh, and supportive schools task force um, that started this summer that will also go be planning all throughout the year um, and looking as how we create a cohesive plan uh, K through 12 for safe and supportive schools and we also had um, the leadership teams of each of the elementary schools came and um, varying numbers in some schools they only had like two teachers that were available to come but the, um, there were several other schools that had five and six teachers who came and they worked as a team and went through a workshop on how to create uh, collaborative teams that can mm -hmm. move a school forward and we'll be working um, with the consultant to various degrees um, throughout the year so uh, I feel like between the new curriculum we have, and we have a new math curriculum for K-1, we have new science curriculum for 4 and 5, we have um, redoing the reading and uh, social studies to have integrated units at all the grades, um, that there was a, a quite a substantial amount of work that was done this summer. Mm -hmm. Great. And the uh, administrative team also went through professional sure. development this summer. We began um, our 10-hour workshop uh, on cultural competency mm -hmm. and um, I think everyone agrees that it was this it's been terrific mm -hmm. terrific program so that is it was it was a very busy summer there was activity everywhere and not to mention the activity of professional development just the use of our schools mm -hmm. uh, it is every year there's more more and more um, activities going on and in the activity column there was just so many projects. I don't think I'm going to read them all because there was just so many, but you, I think this was put into Novus, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. You've seen yeah, yes. all those projects. Yes. Uh, it was a substantial mm -hmm. amount of work. This was our first full summer with the facilities department, mm -hmm. and I, I have to say it has gone very well. Everything was so organized and, and, and laid out in a very um, planned, planful way. And projects got done. It was quite uh, quite an amazing project. One of in this building is the preschool. We were able to convert um, one of the classrooms downstairs, which actually one of the areas which had been offices into another classroom, which is something we've needed for a while. <coughs> uh, and also the new. The, I'm just going to hit a couple highlights. The new track was installed, mm -hmm. and. Um, Unlike our experience with putting the, uh, the other turf down, people were pretty good about not walking on it because that, that was a little bit more sensitive. Uh, and again, at, at Dodison, there was just an enormous amount of work that was done in terms of getting the school retrofitted for um, using, having more classrooms. One thing that um, has always been an issue at Bishop is the drainage and we've really made some headway in that and that's actually sort of a combination of facilities and DPW. So there's just been a lot of, um, of, of things that have done and uh, you know green activities as well in order to improve the, uh, the energy efficiency of the buildings. So uh, I, I think it went well and I, I think in part it went well that was we began the planning of it in January and really had a schedule that we, ha we held to from the very start. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, sorry, oh. Dr. Alice Nappy. Oh. Yeah. I see that there were there's an item mentioned removed trees and tree walls um, that were an obstruction in the Hardy Playground. Has mm -hmm. the equipment been repaired at the Hardy Playground? Yes, great. Mm -hmm. That was one before. 
Mm -hmm. I have a question about Hardy. Are we now done with the envelope repair? I mean, I know that this has been a big issue yes. um, with things leaking through. I the, the last, the, I believe the last it, of it was the done. It's the last of it is done, okay. Yeah. 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 Great. All right, so we've talked a uh, quite a bit about all the other uh, building projects. Um, so to technology, and then I actually have some things that are not in here that I wanted to mention. So August 24th was a very exciting night at Audison. Um, sort of, if you build it, they will come. I think we were all quite surprised about how many students showed up for the BYOD night. Um, we uh, had hoped that we would get at least the same number that we had last year, which was uh, between 60 and 75. And actually the first night we had 160 people at one at point, there was a line going out the door. But what's even more impressive is that we're up to 325 students who have made their choice at Audison to bring their own device. And we have more being added every single day. So that was um, really exciting. I think the way we did it, where we started out with one cluster at Audison and then expanded that to the sixth grade and then expanded that to sixth grade BYOD and now have added um, BYOD for the entire school has really helped parents to see the benefit that technology can have for their students. Um, we also op opened up BYOD at the high school. Um, because high schools, it, we're not um, filtering uh, the kids coming in as much because they can get on the guest network. We know, we found out that, which I didn't know as we were in the process of doing this, that last year we had about 450 students that accessed the guest network on a regular basis at the high school. So what, what was happening is they were coming in with wireless devices, some phones, some iPad, some laptops, and they were accessing the guest network. We now, did, yeah, I was just going to say, doesn't that limit mm -hmm. them to be involved in the classwork and stuff like that? No, I mean, I didn't mean the other doing it during class when they're no, not no, I meant to be use, doing stuff. No, I meant to use the device for classwork and stuff on it, the guest it, network. It, limi it limits um, some of the things they can get at, and it's actually getting more limited. So this way they have to be want to go on the AirPlay network, which we can then mm. um, control and sort of monitor and know. We've cut out video totally from the um, guest network. So if a teacher is having students watch a video on YouTube or something like that, they can't do that on their own device unless they use their phone and they use 3G, which totally By goes around the network. <laughs> <laughs> so um, at the high school level, things are, uh, you know, I, I think that we don't have a real good handle yet on exactly how many students are bringing in, but we'll, we'll know within the next couple weeks. As the committee found out tonight, we now have what's called Safe Connect when you came in tonight, yep. and it requires um, the devices that are on the AirPlay and eventually on Guest as well um, to be registered with the network. So we'll have a better handle on exactly how much. We've actually um, also doubled our uh, wireless cap um, capability and over the next year we'll be looking at redoing what's called our network topography in order to develop backup systems so if one section of the network goes down then another section will kick in but that hopefully that'll be done by the end of the year or, or the beginning of the next school year and a lot of compliments to our IT staff it's another group that just was working long hours even weekends yeah. to make sure that we were up and running and of course the big issue is just the is the, what's behind the scenes is all of the infrastructure the, mm -hmm. the 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 broadband and getting enough the routers there's just a lot behind that you don't see but they work very hard on this not to mention all the devices we were we also were purchasing through capital mm -hmm. um, uh, or even grants from AFS um, so they had to uh, do a lot of work just to get those ready too. I have a question. Do we have an idea of how many teachers are intensively using technology in the classroom, or you know how many are may choose not to? Um, we're you know we're constantly assessing that. I think teachers are all in different places of development. Um, one of the great things that we had at professional development this summer is that we had an, um, an ed camp for technology, so mm -hmm. folks could come there and sort of decide, oh, these ten people want to learn about X, mm -hmm. and uh, we had about a hundred people that came for that. Mm -hmm. So. I think that we'll have a better handle as the year goes on and we um, teachers are going to be more inclined to use technology if they think that kids have it on a regular basis and I think BYOD right. will help help with that and also the number of devices that we've been putting into the schools. Okay. Thanks. Um, another thank you is to High Rock Church. Um, they, they had 
I think about 100 people come in August to do a cleanup around the high school. But in addition to their volunteer work that they've done now, is that the second year, I think, or maybe third year in a row they've done this, they've also dedicated some of their office space for our Millbrook program, which we don't have capacity in the building for. But unfortunately, this year they've, they're going to need, need that. And so we worked this summer with the planning board to be able to use some of the space vacated by uh, one of the agencies over at the, um, over at the senior center. And um, so our Millbrook program is going to be there for the year because ACA, which has entered into an agreement with, re with the board, will be, after, they, after their lease ends in, at Gibbs, they will be taking up a lease there. But meanwhile, we had a year where we're going to be able to have our programs in that space, and it's wonderful. It's, it's air-conditioned. <laughs> that was a plus. But, but we'll have to be thinking this year as to what will happen after that. Uh, and of course, that's one of the things that even when I was filling out these forms, you know, you know, the, one of the questions they asked you, are there programs that you have that you can't even house mm. in your school? And the answer is yes, okay. there is. And so um, I'm not sure we can, we certainly aren't going to be able to house it here, but we have to think about where we're going to house it. Mm. Um, so. You know, one of the things that I think that you're also aware about, and the high school is very proud, is the, all the different high rankings they've ex mm -hmm. they've had in the last uh, last couple of weeks. But I think um, you know, the rankings can vary from whatever you know, a newspaper or a magazine or th is doing it. But the fact of the matter is, no matter which one it is, Arlington High School is being ranked uh, very high. And in fact, we had request today from a magazine to have another interview about what what we do so uh, what, we, what we're doing so well and that's it's really about the teachers and the students of what we're doing well so I want to congratulate the high school but it's really a k-12 mm -hmm. the kids come prepared to the high school and uh, are, are just um, excelling after that so uh, just a couple of other things speaking of our excelling students uh, and our excelling teachers uh, one of the uh, middle school <coughs> teachers, Juliana Keys, sent me um, an interesting little note. And I, I told her, I, I just have to share this with you today. It's actually sharing it with the community. Uh, one of her students went to Japan this summer. And uh, one of the places they were visiting was the Osaka Castle. And this is a castle that happened to be commissioned by Toyota Tomi uh, Hideyoshi. I think that's how you say his name. But at any rate, when they arrived, there was an interview team from one of the news channels there up there who were targeting foreigners to ask them questions about what, um, uh, about um, the particular person, Hadiyashi, I think it's Hadiyashi for the Japanese TV. And they asked her lots of questions and she knew the answer to all of them. <laughs> And so I'm sure that they were, she said she would, they were amazed. But then that speaks to the fact that we do teach geography <laughs> in our schools. <laughs> and we teach more than geography. This, so she was, she was telling her teacher uh, how proud she felt that she was able to do that. And, and you know, we had, as I was talking about opening, um, one, every, every, every principal does some, through, goes through some kind of opening activity. We did it with our administrative teams. Everybody does that. Um, and one of the things they were doing at Odyssey this year, and I just want to share a few things. Um, they did um, this, what do you hope for this year? And, and teachers wrote down on these pieces of paper what they wanted to do. And they're on display in the lobby. I, I don't know if they're on display tonight, but I was reading some of them and I just pulled a few off. There were Every, every faculty member does this, but it, it gives you an idea of who our faculty are. And so let me just read a couple of what they hope for. To listen, not just, a not to, to listen, not just hear. All kids feel comfortable here. To really get to know the students. That all students feel part of a positive and caring community. Have students be excited. 
to inspire creativity and passion for learning. And the, and there was just more and more of, of this type of comment. So this is what our teachers are hoping for this year. And, um, you know, they're starting this, and, and I'm quite confident that they will see the success in all of this as they go through the year. Mm -hmm. So I think we're off to a wonderful start, and um, it's really through a whole network of teaming. I mean, you, you just can't do this without everybody doing a part of it and you've heard some of it tonight but it's it's more than it's it's more than just um those of us sitting here at this table so anyway that's the the report great thank you um only about 12 minutes over so it's not bad <laughs> not bad um next thing on our agenda is the timeline and process of the superintendent evaluation and actually, the reason I put this on is just to have a discussion of, with you guys about what we want things to look like. Um, September 30th is the deadline, according to our bylaws or whatever, the, you know, policies, um, for a superintendent to give us the material for us to look at. Um, then last spring, we had discussed that we wanted to have some sort of retreat. Now, that can be a weekend retreat or it could actually even be um, one of the things we've discussed is having the early part of a meeting in a retreat mode, not in this room, um, to discuss sort of what we've seen, what we're looking for. Um, I think last year there was a sense that we were, we wanted to request certain documents and we, it was sort of maybe too late. Um, and so I wanted to get your feeling about when, what, when you'd like to do that. What we have is, um, we have the entire month of October to sort of digest what the superintendent has given us and request more, or mm -hmm. you know, before we do mm -hmm. our evaluation. So um, the 13th and 27th are meetings. So I guess let me just throw it out to you. What, what do you feel like we should do something beginning of a meeting? Do you want something longer in a weekend or something like that? Dr. Allison, oh. I'm a little confused. Was the retreat, weren't we thinking that was for what, not this evaluation that's the September 30th, but the next one. Am I um, you mean for the next year? Yes. Yeah, for figuring out what we want for the next year. Um, is that what you're saying? Since I, I'm at, I, so I thought that and, oh, and establishing the goals okay. and everything. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we certainly have retreated the sort of spring where we talk about the goals and what we're looking for. And there was a feeling that we wanted to retreat in the fall as well, okay. uh, some sort of, that's what I got a sense of. Uh, yeah, Mr. Hammond. In December, right, right after we do the evaluation, in the past, there was a sit down with the superintendent uh -huh. to establish the goals adjusted from the district goals got and it. stuff. And I, I think for me, part of the confusion is that melding. They should be the same, but for specifics and then bring them to the committee for approval. Okay, so I'm, I'm actually really confused now. That's right. So, <laughs> so, so you're saying that after we do the evaluation in November, we'd like to then revisit sort that of was what, my we're, what we're right That was my understanding. Wrong. I could be wrong. Okay, anyone else have a sense? Because I... Well, my memory is that in a, this, I should have done a little more research, but I think we talked about the fact that we want to just make sure we got interim report or regular reports on the goals. Right. That, was, okay. that was the right. focus. Okay. I wanted to make sure that, you know, every couple of months, mm. Kathy was conscious of giving us information on the mm -hmm. progress towards the goals. Okay, so we should or probably... Or every, I don't know, a couple of months, I don't remember. We should probably talk about that with the calendar, because yeah. right now we just have two dates. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, two dates oh. may be sufficient. Okay. Um, For me, real quick. Yeah, well, one, of the, one of the aspects originally, mm -hmm. Dr. Buddy was setting uh, up a Dropbox yep. to do exactly yeah, right, that. As right. the things come, we go into the Dropbox. Right. That's still being worked on. I mean, my feeling is as soon as something happens mm -hmm. at a meeting, a school, if we have a meeting, say, in December about budget, and it's, it relates to a goal, mm -hmm. just using an example. At the end of that meeting, she gives wink to Karen, and Karen puts it in the Dropbox, and it becomes cumulative. And we have a chance to either look at it on an ongoing basis or wait till September, like some members have indicated, and ask the questions as we go along. Okay. Going along. But there's also, as I'll wait for the calendar part. Okay. For the other okay, aspect. so let's, I mean, I guess then, so it sounds like we're not looking to do any sort of retreat pre thing in October. Um, why don't we then, um, though at least in October, we will have had a chance to, to look at the evidence that's been mm -hmm. presented 
and make requests yeah. in the regular public meeting right. if there's something else that we'd like to mm -hmm. see that, um, yeah. Right. Okay, Mr. Slipin. One of the things that I noted last year is we did have a little bit of confusion as to yes. which parts of the goals we yes. were targeting yes. within the evaluation so that <clears throat> one thing we should be doing is making sure that that portion of the, uh, the tool has the, the specific goals to be evaluated. Because last year that was blank. And when I did the concatenation last year, there was wide stuff, range. Exactly. And the yes. big note I made to myself yeah. to improve things for this year is to make sure that it, within those boxes we put in the right. specific goals and areas that we were evaluating. Right, OK. Saying oh, that, that good. might it's mean mm -hmm. a meeting of the minds to make sure we're all on the same page. Okay, well, why don't For an we... hour and a half hour or something, I don't well, know. Yeah, that, I, that, I, that can go to yeah. the CIA subcommittee well, as well. Okay. Just to, just to arrange the form and pre-populate it in, okay. in, in a way. Yeah. Okay. That's so all we're don't... doing is pre-populating. So, That's all we're doing is pre-populating. Right, pre-populating. So, so one of the things... We may not need to meet, but just... Yeah, yeah. yeah. one of the things that Sounds we good. talked about last spring is having some more chances for informal mm -hmm. meetings, retreat-like meetings, if we need it. So okay. we'll leave that as an open possibility, for, but, but it may not, you know, may not be necessary. Okay. Okay, that's clarity from me. Does anybody else want to talk to the goals? Anything else that we're missing with the timing? Mr. Hainer. I got two areas that I'd like to add to the calendar. Yes, I okay, let's that talk with about you. the calendar, right. right. Okay. I want calendar. to talk about the calendar. Okay, so let's, um, yeah, let's move on to discussion of the calendar. So um, let me give, give you some background. Um, during our uh, retreat in the spring, I think the committee reaffirmed its desire, which I think it had before, but hadn't sort of yet been done, to have a standard year-long flexible calendar, but, but just an, an idea of what does the year look like in the school committee um, with, of course, some flexibility. Um, so Dr. Brody and I worked this summer. We met a couple of times on... On, on just really the preliminary first draft of what that might look like. And um, what I thought made sense is to do it by month in that way, just to give us a little bit more flexibility. It wasn't by meeting. Um, mm -hmm. So, but it's just a first glance and I knew there'd be changes. So let's, let's actually talk about what we'd like to add or delete or, you know, new insights. Um, yes, Dr. Alice okay. I'd actually like to speak to the concept of the year long That's calendar. Great. Cause I think, so, this is good, and I think it's good for us to be thinking ahead in that way, but this is actually kind of not quite what, when we had talked about in the governance um, meetings, what the year-long calendar was meant to be. Okay. My understanding from having had to hash it out with Nancy Walzer and, and try and under, really get it down and put it on paper is that what the year on calendar is trying to do is actually take our goals, mm -hmm. the, the current goals, mm -hmm. and then from them figure out what we want the kind of product to show that the goals have been completed is going to be, whether it's going to be a report, a presentation, or something. So you need to know what that is, and then when is that going to happen? Mm -hmm. And then that's like, that's kind of the really important parts to put in the calendar and then everything else gets kind of fit in around those things okay and it you know going back to the retreat that maybe isn't a retreat. yeah yeah that figuring out what those products or or you know whatever you, deliverables yes yep um whatever you want to call them um figuring out what those are and when they should be done either could be something just done by the chair with mm -hmm. in consultation with the mm -hmm. superintendent or it could be something that we could discuss at a retreat okay um, but so when i look at this this is good but this is actually much more in the weeds than than nancy would have us be she was really looking for us hitting making sure we're getting their goals done mm -hmm. and that we're learning about them and mm -hmm. then you try and spread them out so everything isn't all due in june right because right. then it's just crazy right um, actually i did actually pass this by um, nancy welzer and she had 
she actually only had a small tweak to it, okay. but that doesn't mean that, that you're not absolutely right that her initial vision was something Yeah, that's really different. this is um, how she was I, conveying it then. I, I think this thing is helpful for mm -hmm. chairs, right? So, mm -hmm. so this, we can still create a document like this that is um, sort of, you know, you know we, since we have a rotating chair and there's new chairs every time to sort of, here's sort of basically what we do as a committee. Mm -hmm. um, but this other thing, I think actually just would take more mm -hmm. conversation mm -hmm. about what we want it to look like. And maybe that conversation happens in a subcommittee meeting or in a, in a retreat. I mean, it, it seems like we need to sort of be in agreement about what that vision is, mm -hmm. I think. Um, yeah, Dr. I Dr. think Dr. some of this may come out of a subcommittee or something like uh, of that nature, but could be even fit in here mm -hmm. at different periods yeah. of the time. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. It keeps the goals. We're not creating them in the late spring evaluating them from the year before in November and then right. it keeps us constantly thinking of the yeah. goals during the year and things of that nature it doesn't have to be a long thing but it might out of a subcommittee uh, right. so this is something that has to get done each year I mean this is yes. this can be sort of a standard document that we sort of refer to but but what you're talking about sounds like it should be something that we are really each year thinking afresh about yes okay yeah. um, any suggestion for a subcommittee that would be the appropriate would be a curriculum the curriculum committee yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh why don't we task curriculum um subcommittee to um begin that process and then uh and uh, and i guess make a decision about whether it needs to go to maybe a retreat level at a full mm. committee meeting or just to be discussed I, I, yeah i i just uh, uh, I, I like the structure of this and i think mm -hmm. it's a, a nice outline of the things we normally do with these right. points it's right. uh it's a roadmap of where we intend to go. It, it doesn't seem very, I don't want to use the word controversial, but it just seems to flow with right. uh, with, with past practice so that. I think it's sort of you know, a reminder of what we're yeah. what we do. Exactly. Right. Yeah, I mean, so I think this is fine. Okay. But you want CIA to? To come up with, I guess we need to then talk about the process of what um, this year's, right? This is, I think, the suggestion that this year's goals what's what we need to see from this year's goal to, yeah. to understand yeah. how we're making progress in this year's goals makes yeah. Sense. yeah i think that's something that cia yeah. and you should be so we should sort of okay come up with the yeah. process yeah. Yeah. Do this can, year's well, goal. It, it's what the things you know is you look at each goal is this one going to be yeah. a report mm -hmm. and when is a yeah. good time yeah, for that's that report idea. to be and done? that has to be done each year is it going to mm -hmm. be yeah yeah and and it's just it's a way of making sure that those things are in the calendar mm -hmm. and then that they come up and we can go okay it's time to talk about you know, uh, whatever so and once it's codified yeah we all know that it's coming at a certain time coming, so uh, those people that also the, any of the staff or the superintendent or anybody that needs to make reports they it's it's not oh by the way Kathy we need this next Thursday <laughs> Mm -hmm. They know it's coming. Right. So, so actually, let me make a suggestion to this calendar that we add something in this calendar for each year coming up with that schedule of what, you know, yeah. does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then, but then we, we keep this. We don't throw this away necessarily. No, no. No. Um, I also want to add one thing that uh, Mr. Hainer had suggested, actually Nancy um, suggested as well, um, which is to add um, in March as our, as our practice and our, in our, um, uh, our procedures, um, the superintendent progress on goals that we get a report from mid -year, that. Mid-year report. Mid-year report. Um, so we can put it in the policy. To put it, yeah, well, so we, this is, I think this becomes part of right. policy, yeah. right, at some right. point. But, the, um, but this is also, it, it, it's in line with the, the state's right. evaluation process. That the, it, right. It's an informative, right. how's things going, it, it, I may need some, I need no more time or whatever. Mm -hmm. it, it's, infor it's informative but at the same time informal. Right, right. And okay, so that would be then, we have that mid-year, and then we have the, the one in September. Is that, does that seem like yep. that's, mm -hmm. according with the practice we've yep. done so far, but that seem like what we want, okay. And the yes, no, sure. I also suggested in November, mm. the new goals for the next year are developed after the evaluation by the end of November. But there's flexibility in that. I only stuck it there because we get December packed with budget. The new goals for the next year are developed in November? At, after we have the evaluation in, yeah in november this is the issue that i've yeah. always had with november yeah so you're finishing one you set the, the 
they will be attached to yes, the, the goals, the district goals that we've had before. The personal goals, not the superintendent's yes. goals, not the district exactly. goals. Exactly. Mm. They so may or may not be. Right. But we state them. We're clear. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it's that conversation that, that we have together, the one you and I have had individually about n not the substance, but how it's communicated Got and it. aspects of things like that. Well, you know, yeah. but I mean, you know, the school year started, so you've probably have already identified. Your, I mean, you've already probably identified your goals for the year, right? So you've, yeah. So we it's identified more, the district the, goals right. back in June. Yeah, but even right, your this goals. This is for the next yeah. year, actually. This is the, for. Okay. Right, this is then but jumping Jeff, ahead. this is the issue of having an evaluation yeah. in November. Yeah. Yeah. If we had the evaluation in June, yeah. We would I mean, be, I think we'd, we'd have the new goals for the next year. Yeah. The superintendent could set his or her. <laughs> Why are we back here again? We don't have accountability data in June, you know. Yeah, I know it's a, it's a strange system. Someday, we can hope. We're one of five. <laughs> so I, so, I, so, I, don't, I, so oh God, also no. I think it's a little. <laughs> no? It's, it's, it's a little bit <coughs> odd to kind of, uh, you know, t for the school committee to tell an administrator in, in November, in the middle of the school year, the, we're going to evaluate you on, the, on these goals. But no, I think I think the suggestion is these are the goals then for the after. Even, yeah, I, I appreciate that. But you know, that, there's but a lot. But, large, you're, but you're a third of the way through the year. But, right? but we're, we're, we're in September. Yep. We're evaluating the superintendent on last year's right. Right. goals. Right. November. We're halfway through the year, starting this year's goals. So there has to be some to say either move them so that they're together. Yeah. which there's been resistance since for <laughs> six, five years I've been on the committee, or understand that the individual, there has to be some difference, delineation between the district goals and the superintendent's process, whatever it is, something. Okay, Mr. Slipin. Of course there's delineation. But, I mean, we have to be cyclical, and there are two, thi two points that we need to always have in mind as a school committee. Point number one is... If we're evaluating the, the school year, the previous school year, we can't do that while we're in the middle of the school year, right. especially because the accountability data that we want to look at comes after the conclusion of the school year. So that to evaluate the superintendent or to come to a final conclusion on the goals in June puts us in a position where we'd be doing it without all the right. requisite information. So, now, let, let me finish. Point number two, in terms of evaluating any superintendent specifically, and this has nothing to do with the current superintendent, it is a structural thing, in that the way almost all superintendent contracts are written, mm. that you normally have a decision point on a renewal year that falls around the end of December. Right so that we're structuring around those two usual landmarks that, that impact everybody. So that, to, so that to have a final event, we know where we're trying to go and there are a lot of things that we'll know about in June and we can plot out some of the goals, but to, do, to close the book on it and have anything final on this before we look at accountability data and have all the data we have from the previous school year does a disservice to us, does a disservice to the community, and, and throws out important data that we should be using analytically. Right. Now fortunately we're a high performing district so that we haven't had any evil surprises over the past couple of years coming through the accountability measures. Things are, you know, and I don't expect to spend a lot of time looking at uh, testing data this year, especially because we're held harmless with the switch over <laughs> to, no uh, to park. <laughs> so. But we do want to monitor how we're doing vis-a-vis uh, second language learners. We want to make sure that the that, that high needs population is being served well. It's always been a concern of this committee, to our credit, and we won't really know those results till we get the accountability scores in. So we've landed on sort of this wacky structure. It is not neat. It is not clean. We're, we're doing evaluation to the prior school year in September and October but it's just the nature of the beast. We're going to be in this situation as long as, and, and I don't see why we keep 
bumping up against it. Let, let's just realize what we are as a publicly governed district and, and go with the flow. So actually, can I get clarity from Mr. Hainer about your suggestion, what your suggestion is? My is suggestion is- we Is do, there a change or- My suggestion is, is one of two things. I'll get to that real yeah. quick. Mr. Schlickman, we evaluate all our teachers by the end of June. Yeah. We do not wait for state's performance and it's dealing with their, and they still are in their evaluation subsequent years is reflected on the state's uh, performance, which is, makes me a little shaky. We should not be judging our superintendent just on statistical state performance alone. I agree with that. Now getting back to your question that you asked yeah. me, one of two things has to happen. We have to make a distinction, a delineation between the district goals, they may be somewhat, mm -hmm and the superintendent's personal goals. Right. They may be reflective. The problem is we're six months into one district goal and six months left over a prior district goal by the time we get into, or five months into yep. November. It, it, that's what's caused confusion to this old man each year yeah. of which goals I'm evaluating. So are you suggesting that there, there be a change in um, the, 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 the amount of time the superintendent goals are being evaluated and the and amount of time that the district goals are being evaluated. The majority of districts in the time. Commonwealth do a regular school year evaluation. No, I, mean, I know okay. that, I know. So they don't, what I'm saying is, I have no problem with the district goals, they're in a good place. Okay. They're in a good place for the upcoming year. I'm, all I'm saying is if we're gonna to continue to evaluate the superintendent in November to uh, allow for the, the state data, I think it's important for us, for the superintendent's personal goals which is a piece of her, the, the superintendent's evaluation, not the whole thing, that they be delineated clear. I'm having confusion. Could, I'm still be evaluated in November. So this yes, not, you're not yes, I'm change. not suggesting changing. So you're just suggesting clarity with respect yes. to this, but no time change. Absolutely. Okay, so that sounds like I have no problem with that as long as we have the superintendent's personal goals. Personal goals are clear for the exact same amount period of time. It would be a 12-month period are being evaluated, so the previous yes. year. Yes. Okay, does that seem, are we going to? I mean, you know, it, it is what it is. I mean, if, if, if we're doing this in a piecemeal, piecemeal basis where there are things we can evaluate in June, Fine, I'm but, so but not, I'm saying doing like, it in November, it like, or or, or or to document or whatever. But the the one thing is, I've evaluated teachers, I've evaluated superintendent, I've you know, done district evaluations and looked at our goals. They're all different animals. The way I look at a teacher is very different than the way I'm looking at a superintendent because I've got access to a lot more data. I'm watching a teacher on a day to day basis. I know who they are, and generally speaking, the data coming from a classroom is fairly consistent and if there's something that I'm really interested in, I'm monitoring that across the school year in a much more intimate way than we can as a school committee so, so, go okay, so, deal with so, any superintendent. Just a, so, it sounds like uh, Mr. Hainer's suggestion mm, is that mm, we do both evaluations in November, mm, mm -hmm. um, both the district goals mm. and the superintendent's personal goals and that we evaluate them both in, in, in November and that the evaluation period be for the previous year, mm -hmm. yes. September yeah. through June. Yes, right. Okay, that's fine. so that sounds good. So, okay, is that, is that clear? I mm -hmm. thought that's what we do. Yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we do not, I have not seen for me a delineation between the district goals and the personal you want, goals. You want just some to be spelled the out. The personal goals later. will run from December 1st to the evaluation. The district goals run, what? we're looking at 2015-16 district goals for this evaluation. Right, well, yeah, right, yeah, that's right. right. Okay, that's right. We but should both. be looking at December 1st to November personal goals. I do not have a personal goal clear in my mind, personal goals delineated from district goals. And, that's, and I'll accept this year. Uh, that, going forward, I just want to right. have that delineation. That's all. So, okay. So, yeah, uh, Dr. Alessandri. I'm sorry sound for like raising you. my I'm voice. I'm still confused. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's. I think maybe we could bring a copy of yes. the form. Okay. And talk. I mean, and start preferably fill it in what the different things are, so we all know what we're talking about. What What I would like is to have a copy of the district goals and the personal goals. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Well, that's, but the form, I, I like the, the form. Okay, and as far as the, the form is pre-populated as and, and Mr. Schlichman yes, suggested, that's fine. Yeah. that might add some with, yeah, with yes. the okay. district goals, then I'd like to see those two because that way I know where everything fits in on the one. Yep. And then I can look at the other two. Okay. So okay. Saturday morning. That sounds great. So, uh, so refresh my memory. Have we, have we ever had a process by which we select personal goals for the superintendent? I thought the superintendent, I thought. I thought she selected her. Yeah, I thought yeah. that was part the, of yeah. the whole process. Yep. Right. That's what I the understand. The state says that that is to be, the superintendent can offer them to us a discussion. We have to agree to them. Okay. I have no problem. I, the probability of accepting what the superintendent presents to me is very high. And, and just for my clarity, I, um, the superintendent offers them to us in at the end of September, or offers no, them to us. No, at the last, a, after the, the, the evaluation. Last, after the evaluation. See, That's I, why I, I picked the end of November. Wait, well, it's, it's wait, a, we're talking yeah. two different years yeah, here. I'm we're getting our years <laughs> confused. <laughs> That's you're the, talking about the year that we're evaluating. Yeah, that, right, right. And you're talking about the next year. I'm so talking, you two aren't. The, the, the personal goals should be from December to November of the same year oh. that the district goals ran from Ju July November. through June. Oh. Yeah. That's the confusion. Okay. Yeah. I think I don't necessarily agree with what Mr. Hainer is saying, except to say that I think we need to have the personal goals clearly identified. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think his idea of the timing is good yep. to make a statement about what time period they cover right now. I'm not willing to go there. Um, but Why don't we send this to CIA? Yeah, we'll, yeah. <laughs> Curriculum yeah. assessment. Yeah. Um, to have a meeting to sort of um, hash out some of this and see if we can get something that makes Fine. sense to bring That's back great. to us. Um, okay, so let, let's do that. So. Okay. Works. So you have a lot of work to do, Paul. Well, I, that seems <laughs> to fit into that calendar, the year-long calendar it, yeah, thing. It's, it's yeah. the same discussion. Yeah. It's the same discussion. Okay, so let's do that. Um, let's come back and look at the calendar again um, in October after we've had some of those meetings um, for hopefully a final you know, thing. Is there any, any other additions, subtractions, comments in the calendar that we'd want to come at? The, okay. Okay. Well, just yes, Dr. Allison. Um, budget, so mm -hmm. what you've, I, I'm sorry, I lost the form for a moment. Yeah, budget stuff. Um, so what you've got is how budget's done it the last couple years, mm -hmm. but that's subject to change, you know, it, it gets moved around a little bit. Right. Um, so I'm fine with this being on here now, but it, once we pass the budget calendar, which we'll need to do fairly soon, we can update this. Okay. I would prefer not to see this go into policy because I think this gets, I mean, the, this, the, I think there can be a reference no. to a year long calendar, a, yeah, but yeah. I don't think it should actually be in policy because like at least the budget part's going to change year to year. I mean, right. the exact timing of the different. Right. Things. You might want to use I mean, I, in I, policy, just say the current uh, calendar. Well, yeah, I mean, my, my feeling was that we could send this to policy with a strong caveat saying, of course, this is subject to sort of shifting around. But if, if that's not something that we're comfortable with, then we can just, policy. I mean, <clears throat> one of the things we want to do is create a school committee handbook. This kind of thing should be in that, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, but with the caveat, you know, it's flexible. And this <laughs> this sure. is something that we want to have for mm. the public too. I mean, this is Absolutely. really useful. It's yeah. just, Absolutely. I don't want it to be, put in a place like policy where it's this is what it will then be we have this to, year mm -hmm. right you know we have this to is, change this is, it by we want this yeah. is the 2015 or two yeah. i don't know what the date 16 17 16 right. 17 great okay. calendar okay perfect and then and then the next year they can, okay that's yeah. that sounds great i like that idea okay Yes. No, no. Yep. no I okay. think we're done. I think Excellent. we got, I think we <laughs> we got it all. I think this is cooked. <laughs> Beat that one cooked. to death. Okay, so on to consent agenda. Um, all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted in one motion. There will be no separate discussion of any of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the <clears throat> item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant number 16188, dated uh, June 9th, uh, 16, in the amount of 
uh, $592,323.75. Approval of warrant number 16194, dated June 23rd, 16, in the amount of $1,175,592.69. Approval of warrant 16199, dated June 30th, 16, in the amount of $145,837.75. Um, Approval of warrant 16200, dated July 14th, 16, in the amount of $44,386.42. Approval of warrant 17023, dated August 11th, 16, in the amount of $427,972.61. Approval of warrant 17029, dated Eight, um, August 25th, uh, 16, in the amount of 561,249.04. And approval of minutes, regular minutes for June 9th, 2016. Um, so moved. Well, hold on, so, sorry, Dr. Allison I said so moved. Oh, so moved, great. Second. <laughs> uh, okay, so moved by Dr. Allison Ampey, seconded by Mr. Hayner. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 And aye. Um, that's unanimous. Okay, uh, subcommittee liaison reports and announcements, and I suspect um, there will only be a couple of announcements, but let's see, uh, budget? Um, budget has nothing to report. We will need to be scheduling a meeting sometime soon to start working on the calendar. Great. <laughs> uh, community relations. Is Cindy. Cindy. Cindy, right, so she's no not here. And I'm on that committee and we haven't met, so, okay. Um, district accountability, curriculum instruction and assessment. It uh, looks like we've got some uh, agenda items. Great. Uh, facilities. No reports. No report. Um, policies and procedures. It's my intent to have at least one meeting a month. You've already given me some stu us some stuff to work on. Yes. Do you want to talk to that? Yeah, well, just briefly, uh, we have a document with us tonight uh, on an audit that was done, and uh, it is my intent to meet with the superintendent to develop part of a policy and a staff committee to work on the recommendations from that audit report. Uh, it's my hope to have that for us for the next meeting. Um, school enrollment task force. October 5th. October 5th is our meeting. 6.30 in the Lions Room. 6.30 Lions Room. Okay, great. Um, the warrant committee. Everyone was paid on time throughout the summer. Great. Uh, any liaison reports? Any additional announcements? Um, that I don't know if the superintendent was going to talk to it. Uh, Bill Bridges, the, there's a conference coming up. You all received a, a, an invite. I would like to go. Oh, right. uh, yeah. I'd ask the committee uh, if they would sponsor me and anyone else that would like to go. I think it's a. It looks something something good. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. Do uh, does Mr. Spiegel, do you want to talk to that? The conference. So yeah, um, the MPDE is uh, sponsoring a conference this year called uh, Building Bridges, with a uh, uh, the keynote speaker is uh, Claude Steele, mm -hmm. um, who's the author of Whistling Vivaldi and among other books. Um, we are also um, John Safier is going to yep. be at the conference and uh, um, on a panel and do a lunch presentation and. Dr. Bodie is going to be a panelist. Uh, it's going to be an all-day conference at in Randolph at uh, Lombardo's, um, and uh, mm -hmm. we're trying to. Uh, it's October seventh, mm -hmm. um, which is a f the f it's the Friday before uh, Columbus Day weekend, mm -hmm. um, but um, <coughs> looks to be a good conference. Yeah. We've been mm -hmm. planning it. That book, by the way, is a book that all administrators are reading right now. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. As part of the cultural conference, yeah, great. Do I need um, a motion? So I guess so. Mr. Hannah has requested that he um, serve as our representative from the school committee. Um, do I have a motion? So moved. Okay, Dr. Allison Ampey makes made the motion. Second. Second. <laughs> Second by uh, Mr. Slickman. Mm -hmm. um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 So, yeah, so unanimous. If I may, okay. uh, just like to remind everyone, town night is September 16th, down out, uh, in the field across from the uh, Boys and Girls Club, with the fireworks at the end of the night, and town day is September 17th, which is each year it gets bigger and better. I invite everyone to come. Another reminder, we have a bunch of, uh, we had an election today. We have another election on the 20th uh, for the Minuteman. Um, 
And uh, that election is odd by state law. We're only allowed to be open, the polls are only allowed to be mm -hmm. open for eight hours. So mm -hmm. they're open from 12 to eight at, for the most part at people's regular polling places with the exception of Stratton, which I know, you know, has been <laughs> under construction. Do, do, do you know if we can vote absentee in that? Can we actually? Yes, you can. Yeah, yes. Okay, great. Okay, great. <clears throat> Okay. Um, any requests for future agenda items at this stage? Okay. Yes, Mr. I, I, I would hope that we can talk about the fiscal impacts of uh, the possibility of, a, of an unlimited expansion of charter schools uh, between now and in November. I think that would be a good one. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. we, will, we can maybe invite somebody into. Mm -hmm. Or I mean, I, I know you're, you you know a lot about things, so maybe we can have you talk to that matter. Um, I know, I mean, it's unfortunate that Ms. Mm -hmm. Johnson isn't here. I know that there are some other sort of just reports that we need on um, stuff that's happened at the State House over the summer and, and and spending that's happened over the summer. So hopefully we can get that information soon. Um, we very soon will have something um, by Eileen Woods. We'll meet Eileen Woods. Um, we'll also. Um, uh, Ms. Elmer, uh, we missed her this spring, <laughs> um, and so hopefully we will um, we'll ha we'll meet with you soon. So we're working on that as well. Okay. Um, okay. So now we have an executive session to go into. We will not be coming out of the executive session, um, you know, for the public meetings. So. Um, Executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with the union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. To conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted. And as I understand, only one of the items on this agenda we'll, we'll be discussing right now, which is the assistant superintendent's contract. Okay. Okay. So we will wait a couple minutes till we're, we're off. But call the vote. Here's oh, we have to make a motion. I'm sorry. So the so mo move. So, uh, we're going to also vote on the MOA, aren't we? Uh, what I understand is that we're huh? pushing that to the next meeting. I see. Um, for timing reasons. Yeah. So we'll we'll ha we have to have an executive session next meeting. In fact, we have a couple of things I think that we'll be bringing in. Um, okay, so uh, so move. It's a motion by Mr. Hayner to move into executive session. I know we have to second okay. it by uh, Dr. Alison Ampey. I know we have to take a roll call. Um, Mr. Yes. Hardin. Yes. <laughs> yes. Dr. Alison Ampey, Mr. Yes. Slickman, yes. Mr. Hayner, yes. Mr. Thielman, and I say yes. 